Good morning, Sofa Squad. How's everybody out there doing? I'm doing pretty good here at the campground. I have been buried in watching this case that we're going over. Uh, I watched a lot of it in real time yesterday, and then I had to watch some of it in replay last night, this morning, and I mean, my God. Gosh, y'all, day two. One thing about this case that I think is interesting is it's been very technical so far, but until we got to day two, we finally see some emotional type testimony, whether it was from one of the witnesses or the, the just absolutely heart-wrenching body cam footage that we saw and then some of the anchoring footage that we saw from the police cam videos. So we've got a lot to cover today. So without further ado... Let's review! So the first person on the stand is Carla Riviera. Now this is no relation to uh, Amber Geiger's partner, uh, Martin Rivera. But she gets up there and she's basically just talking about you know, the timestamps, what time the call came in. Now, dispatch was sent out like a minute later and the first people got there at like two minutes. Now, they play the 911 call. We've pro A lot of us have already heard this multiple times at this point. It's very uh, difficult to listen to uh, for numerous reasons. Obviously, the tragedy of it. Now, you know, very soon into the phone call, she's saying, you know, oh, I thought it was my apartment. You know, I shot the guy. And then very soon into there, we hear, hear her say that she's effed. Uh, we hear her say she's going to lose her job. And I think for a lot of us, this is where we're just like, what? You know, I mean, it's just, the uh, it flies all over me. I still just can't, every time I hear it, y'all, my blood just runs hot. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Now, there's a couple of times that she's like, hey, bud. And honestly, to me, it sounds like she's probably nudging him with her foot. I mean, it's just, there's no signs, in my opinion, of her trying to help this guy, trying to do CPR, none of that. Now, I understand that everyone's freaked out in this moment, so on and so forth, but I feel like, you know what, she's held to a higher standard because of what she does. So while there is going to be some level of shock or whatever, it just, you know, seeing in this 911 call that, like, when squeezed a little bit, her first concern is oh my gosh, my job, and doesn't seem to move away from that concern. So the next witness so the next witness on the stand is Sergeant Stephen Williams. Now he's kind of like a technical person and he's talking about how the cams work, you know, how we tell what time they were put on, what time they were taken off. During his testimony, a phone goes off. I was like, oh my God, everyone take cover. The judge was relatively calm and they just all moved past that and they kept going. And basically he's up there just talking about like the technicality aspect of these body cams and the fact that, you you know, yeah, their footage isn't that great. You know, these are the different pixels and what it means. And he's essentially up there to lay the groundwork for all the body cam footage that will be seen shortly. Now, the third person up there was Michael Lee. He is essentially the neighborhood police officer. Now, he, him and his partner, Blair, they were, like, some of the first people on the scene. And he's saying, you know, they confirmed, like, would you use your radio for a situation like this in Amber's? And yes, I would. You know, it's a faster link than calling 911. It's like, you know, you're going straight to the source. Now, we see his body cam footage. And, y'all, I mean, it gives me goosebumps right now. I mean, this is where this all becomes very real. And so, you know, we see, and this is, and this gave me so much anxiety, y'all when they're trying to get into the complex and obviously now that we know what we know it's like oh my gosh you know this guy's in there dying on his apartment floor alone and like and it's not their fault I mean but this is what happens with these apartment complexes so I hope one thing that can come from this is you know what happens in these scenarios when 911's called an emergency to these apartment complexes that are like locked down heavily you know is there something that can be done to enable them to get in quicker now so we see him they finally make their way to the apartment you know we hear Amber talking you know I thought it was my apartment and you know he immediately Immediately, it's just bam like doesn't even think about it they're on that floor they're doing CPR they are trying to assist him you know it has not gone unnoted that she has not been doing that and one thing if you remember like before this trial started coming out where it was like you know okay well there was some remnants of first aid stuff on the floor but they weren't sure if she had done that because it was a little bit iffy and I think he even talked about it like it looks like she had gotten stuff from his apartment and done CPR and now she didn't do any of that that was the other people responding there did that so there's no she did not try and help this guy whatsoever except for saying you know hey bud that seems to be about the extent of her help for him so we see the paramedics arrive they take him away it's very chaotic it's very I mean scary is not the word for 
for it. It's just sad. It's very, very sad. So then they question him again, and they're like, you know, was he alive? Was he conscious when you got there? Yeah, he had a faint uh, pulse. And they established that, you know, we were trained. We started CPR right away, and they never stopped CPR. I mean, if you see in the video where, like, once the paramedics get over, they take over. They're on the stretcher going down with him. I mean, they don't quit doing this. Now we see some still photos from his body cam to kind of give us an idea of where the victim was, like, with his shoes. Uh, and then they go in to talk about lights and whatnot, because this is, like, a big thing in this is, you know, because when you open the door, you know, it's just like it was dark, well, there's light switches right there. And so this becomes a big aspect, like, are you, you know, in training, are you supposed to use lights? And da 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 da, da. And it sounds kind of odd to hear it, you know, because it's almost like common sense. But, you know, it's something that they have to establish. So then, you know, they go into this line of questioning. It's like, basically, like, you know, do responding officers act like Geiger? Do they just start shooting people right away? And obviously that's no, and, and things of this nature. Uh, and so then, you know, they confirm that the apartment smelled like weed because this is another thing of, like, you know, apparently, you know, and we hear even from his neighbor later that, yeah, they, you know, he smoked weed. I mean, it is what it is. And so his apartment smelled like weed. So that should have been, like, a major especially for a cop, you know, like, hmm, my apartment doesn't smell like weed. Maybe this isn't mine. So what, it's just another one of those things that you should have noticed. And then another thing that I thought was interesting, because even when I watched the video, I thought this, and basically they just confirm with him that the, the female that we see on the, the stretcher with him is not Amber, because at a quick glance, it looks like Amber, because they wear their hair in the same kind of bun or whatever. So the state makes sure to establish that, no, that is not Amber. You know, remember, she has really not tried to do anything for this guy whatsoever. Now, also, they use they utilize this witness to confirm that, yeah, after an arrest, we're basically kind of just doing paperwork, hanging out. You know, we can recharge our batteries. We can eat. We can rest. So this whole thing of, like, oh, the, my radio batteries weren't working or, you know, oh, I was exhausted, you know is they're poking holes in that, obviously. Then they also bring up the fact that the maintenance person could have been in the apartment, which is, remember, on Reese had mentioned that too, about the dog and the maintenance person, and, you know, my God, what if she had come home and... <laughs> The maintenance guy was in her apartment. I mean, was she had just pulled her gun out and blasted him away? I mean, one has to ask. It sounds dramatic. But, I mean, at this point, you're just like, anything's possible with this woman. Now, when the defense gets up there, you know, he's basically like, you know, establishes that this uh, this person's been there before this complex and that he smelled weed there before. Uh, you know, so this wasn't like an uncommon thing. Uh, that, you know, yeah, she was acting panicky, upset. Um, and, and then the big thing for the defense with all these people is, you know, are you as an officer mentally prepared better when you're going in on a call as opposed to you just walk into your home and somebody's in there robbing it, you know, type situation, which I'm not going to even doubt that that has something to do with it. But honestly, to me, it's so completely different because I'm just like, there was so much negligence on her part of arriving at a, the, a wrong person's house and then shooting and killing them before we can even get to comparing it to, well, walking in my house and there's a robber. I mean, it's just, that's my whole thing. I mean, this is supposed to be a, a trained, observant person. And, I mean, clearly that's not the case. Now we hear from another officer, uh, Duega. I'm probably butchering his last name there. But, you know, we see his body cam footage. He arrives there. You know, we see the chaos of the running around, trying to get in. He gets up there. You know, we see him running back and forth. You know, he greets the, the paramedics. They come in. Now, when the defense gets up there with him, the defense, like, shows two pictures. Can you tell the difference between these floors? And the defense is trying to do stuff like, you know, obviously they're having this thing with the officers because there's this difficulty in getting in. And so they're trying to really exaggerate the aspect of, could you tell the difference? Did you know where you're at? Is the apartment complex confusing? Da, 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 da. And again, no one's really up for debate that this is the case here. You know, I mean, it's obvious through testimony and stuff that, sure. I mean, if you've lived in an apartment complex, I mean, this I can get. But there's some things that I'm just like, okay, there's a level of, oh, whoops, I went to the wrong floor. And this, this is totally different. I mean, this is, you were in la-la land for a long time. And to me, that's at the heart of it. Of, you know, it's not so much like, oh, I made a mistake, went to the wrong floor. I mean, other tenants there have done the same thing. You know, but to arrive at the situation and then the reaction is the huge, you know, aspect of, look, you know, this is a trained officer going into this. I mean, there's just, you know, my gosh. Y'all, the this, this next witness we're going to talk about, Sergeant Valentine, woo! Okay, y'all, I'm not going to lie. My, I got heated over this one. And this one I was watching last night. I had to come back and watch her testimony. 
And I was sitting there. I mean, I have goosebumps right now, y'all. I mean, and I was talking to me. I was like, wait, am I seeing this right? I could not believe this. So, anyways, so Sergeant Valentine, she gets up there. She was very quick on the scene. She was basically next door when she got the call. So, essentially, we see the same thing. There's this chaos. They get in. We see Amber on her body cam. She goes in the apartment. She sweeps the apartment. You know, we see officers. They're there. They're doing their CPR. Now, they show one of the still frames from her body cam, and it is Amber texting on her phone outside the apartment. And I'm just like, Oh my god, that y'all. I mean, I was I had a tweet typed up and I was like, Don't send it, Paul. Don't send it, you know, because I'm just like, Are you kidding me? Now, again, whether it's protocol to separate whatever, I mean, it just when you start looking at the evidence of almost immediately when she realizes, Oh my gosh, this is my apartment. You know, it is this concern of my job. And she's out there. All these people are running around trying to save his life. She didn't apply CPR. She didn't do any of that. She is on her phone rustling up the friends and stuff and whoever else, her little boy toy, that we're going to be seeing in a minute. It's very angering. It's very angering. Now, this officer, the sergeant, does say, you know, when I arrived, I knew it was an officer-related shooting, but I didn't know the details. I didn't know what it was. You know, so, and I get that. You know, I can understand that aspect. And so, basically, they're like, look it is protocol that we separate the officer from the situation and so she what she was going to do is basically take amber down to her car and she does this so that stories can't be overheard or changed or whatever and that part i i get that i mean that to me is just like okay that's logical you know so we see a few different angles and some footage with this witness and so we one angle that we see that's very telling to me is the the cameras at the complex so we see her bringing amber downstairs to where her car is and well she brings Amber and she puts her over here and she walks away and basically a, a group of people come up who we later learn are like other officer friend type people and you see one of them hug Amber and again I was just like are you kidding me are you kidding me she has just killed a man upstairs is concerned about her job and now she's downstairs with people consoling her I mean, it's just so angering. And, you know, I try and be, like, open-minded about things, like, you know, whatever. But it's just the fact that, I guess for me, I just feel like, because her first, she doesn't seem concerned that she seems more concerned with her job and her own well-being than the guy she just killed. You know, and it's almost like, no, you don't get to just have an accident and take somebody's life away and then get hugs over it. You know what I'm saying? It's just, oh, my God. So... Sergeant Valentine brings the car back up. She goes over. She gets Amber. She puts her in the car. Amber gets in. Amber gets back out and goes over to her friends and then comes back and sits in there. So let's stop right here for a second. So this sergeant is saying that it is protocol to separate the officer and keep them basically alone. So we kind of see like, well, then why are all her friends hanging out and talking? Well, the state, and this becomes a big objection. They have to haul the jury out and go into one of their huge things because obviously the defense does not want this shown. And we'll get a bit more into like what comes up. So the state is essentially saying, look, you know, this is not how everybody is treated. This is special treatment here. You know, they're, you know, making sure that, you know, she gets the car. She's hanging out with her friends. You know, Sergeant Valentine just said that she has to be isolated. Clearly, she's not. She's over here hugging this guy. So another thing that happens is someone from, like, the, the Dallas Police Association was called onto the scene. And he comes and he gets Amber out of the car. And he instructs the sergeant to turn the cameras in the car off. And this becomes a huge thing because the state is basically saying, look, we get that if she was with her lawyer or like her partner, which does happen later, we can't use that in evidence to show the jury. Like that's off limits or whatever. You know, but this is not. And I mean, essentially he's like, you know, saying like, look at what they're doing. They're playing the good old boy system here. And we want to show that. And I think they should, you know, because I mean, seeing that, I mean, yo, I can't, I mean, I, I'm calm about it right now. But, I mean, it really sent me over the edge. So, we see this going on now. And she's in the car before the guy comes and gets her out. You know, she's on her phone. She's just sitting there, whatever. And so, all that takes place. So, essentially, the judge ends up being, essentially, like, the judge says, you can't question Valentine about that aspect. So, the, that part is kept from the jury. You know, because it's like, well, what's the relevance or whatever? And it's, it's just very frustrating to me.
also at another point during this, we see where they bring Botham down. And I mean, they're like feet away from the car, getting the ambulance up, I guess, and doing pressure on him. And it's just, you know, she's in the car. And, you know, you just wonder, like, I mean, what's going through her mind, if anything, right now? Or is she just sitting there like, oh, my God, I hope he doesn't die so I don't lose my job. I mean, that's essentially what I feel like she was saying. So the state is saying that, you know, the sergeant broke protocol from keeping her separated and turning the cam off and all this. And the judge just straight up asked her, well, why do you not think you broke protocol or whatever? And she says, you know, what, I thought that I had done something wrong by leaving the camera going because when my boss essentially, you know, is like, uh, look, go turn that off. You know, I thought I had done something wrong. So, and she goes into like this whole thing about, you know, well, you're allowed to talk with the supervisor privately and this and the other. So, like I said, the judge rules that, look, you know, she can say all this stuff, but you can't question her about the president guy walking up to the car in that aspect. Now, we're going to go through a line of witnesses that kind of just went very quickly. So, uh, another officer gets up there. He was really hardly on the stand at all. He was the bike cop or something. And they talk about his cam footage. He's gone. Uh, then, the tox another witness gets up there for the toxicology report. This is a very big point of, you know, interest. Uh, and there was no alcohol or drugs in her system. And he took her uniform for analysis and things like that. Uh, then we have another police department detective person get up there. And he actually is showing video of them testing the fobs and so we can see how it works and it is it's like a little fob you stick in the door and if it doesn't work it basically is like beep 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 and it's red and if it works you hear that mechanical and it's green and you can turn the key and open it so that's kind of with him that's the biggest thing and again some of the stuff like the defense got up there and talks about you know how overtime isn't an option you know and, well what would you do if you walked into your house and there was a robber in there and, and things of this nature so then we hear from one of the fire rescue guys and he's just you know confirming kind of what we saw in the video of you know i got there bottoms on the floor you know we get him on the stretcher down the ambulance you know yes officers were giving him cpr we kept doing cpr uh he you know basically had no pulse wasn't breathing Breathing, and they do the GCS scale, which is kind of a, a rating system from bad to worse. Three is the worst, 15 is the best. He says that, yeah, Botham was a three. Next, we hear from the former regional manager of the complex complexes. And essentially, she's getting up there to explain, like, the layouts of this. You know, first of all, she's like, yeah, we never had any issues with Botham. Uh, they confirm the layouts of the apartment complex. Uh, they confirm, like, the floor plan layouts. Uh, they show us some, like, outside pictures of the complex. They show us some inside pictures of the complex. And they talk about the security cams they have. There's 15 of them. And they go into, like, showing where they're at and the, vis the, the area that they cover and things of this nature. You know, how they work, where the footage goes, how long they keep the footage. Then they talk about the deadbolts in the door, the key fobs, how they're programmed in the office, and, you know, if it doesn't match, it doesn't open, so on and so forth. Now, the defense gets up there, and the one point of interest that the defense brought up is that at some point in her testimony before, uh, like during the, you know, interviews and stuff, she had said that, yeah, the doors can be held open if you don't let it just close and you kind of you have to be very intentional but you can keep it from closing so to me it sounds like i've seen doors like this i mean i don't know what this door is like i'm just going with things that i've seen before and like doors that have an automatic closing thing if you're really super careful about it and you like kind of prop it it can stay open and not do that so i mean that's what i think the defense is getting at now y'all the person who took the cake for the day as far as get your tissues out was his neighbor joshua brown again i have goosebumps i mean oh my gosh if you watched it i mean i'm getting like that kind of like my face is going numb talking about it so you know he's he was a neighbor he talks about how earlier that day um the leasing people had come and like knocked on him and botham's door and he said that there was a noise complaint and i wonder if this is where the rumors about uh, Amber having issues with noise with him came from uh, or if that was legitimate I don't know if you know anything about that like a proof of it type situation drop it like it's hot in the comments but he said that him and Botham that's the first time they've ever met and then they each were basically like yeah we're both smoking weed and they both kind of thought that what they were really knocking on the door for was 
maybe because of that, maybe to confirm that, I don't know. So, you know, that was that, they go back in their apartments, yada, yada, yada. So then he shows later that evening where he came home and like where he gets off the elevator. And so once he gets off the elevator, he basically says, you know, he describes the sound of like two people being surprised by one another and then two shots going off. Now he can't hear exactly what they're saying. And he says, you know, basically he was able to get into his apartment and go in there. Now he says when he's on in his apartment, he basically goes in the back balcony and looks through a window and he can see like Amber come out of Botham's apartment you know she's on the phone she's crying he hears the whole explaining you know what went wrong I went to the wrong apartment da, 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 da. and so then he goes and like looks out the peephole and he sees Amber pacing on the phone and then she goes back in the apartment and you know they talk a little bit about you know him knowing Botham or whatever and he's like he can hear Botham in the morning singing like gospel music and Drake and whatnot and he starts crying and it's so touching. It makes me want to cry right now. I mean, because it was just so, it, it's the human touch in this that we've kind of looked to Amber for that we haven't seen. And, you know, obviously his family's emotional, but finally to kind of see a, a, someone not related to him, but in this situation, do almost like what's appropriate and cry over it because it is, it's so sad. And just that little human touch of, knowing that like you know here's this guy he's getting up in the morning he's singing i mean ugh, it just it, it ripped my heart out so they take a break over this they let him gather himself they come back and so they talk more about these voices and he's essentially like look these voices were mixed up i couldn't make out what they were saying and they go in a line of questioning which is like did you hear put your hands up no did you hear show me your hands no any other commands that a police might say no and he comes down he puts a sticker where his apartment is and basically lives across the hall from uh from botham and the defense gets up there and makes sure to establish that he did not hear what they actually said. You know, talking about the leasing people come by, talking about, you know, he didn't really know the exact times because I guess he didn't have a watch on or things like this. And he said, you know, he was still affected by the stress of all this, obviously. So they established that he too has gone to the wrong floor and he said that he's actually done it several times. And then he says that he's even gone and like all the way and put a, his key in the wrong door once and then realized it was the wrong floor. And then he said that one time, because they're like, well, how did you realize this? And he's like, well, I saw the decorations and so forth that they've been talking about with a neighbor. Now, the next witness is a chemistry teacher in high school and a football coach. And uh, he gets up there. He's a former neighbor. He lived in 1425. So they show timestamp pictures that basically like show, you know, it shows truck pulling in and they establish, you know, when he parks and he sees officer when he gets out of his truck i'm assuming this is amber and so you know she had like a bag with her or whatever and he says that he goes to his apartment and his apartment and basically starts to make food or something and here's two shots and he said that he kept hearing a female voice that was saying there was someone in my apartment there was someone in my apartment and he never he too never heard anything like about you know Hey, put your hands up or, you know, show me your hands or anything that the police might say. The defense gets up there. And a lot of this stuff, y'all, you know, the defense just kind of re ask the same questions. It gets a little boring. And, you know, they try and do a theme on most all of these things of, you know, you know, did you know, were you, have you ever been confused with the complex and things of this nature? And it, it becomes a little bit redundant. The next witness, we are just going to call him the software engineer. I, I can't pronounce his name barely could get his name spelled out so i don't want to uh, offend him or anything trying to even say that name so we're going to call him mr software engineer and he was up there he's another neighbor he was on a skype call with his dad in india when he heard the gunshots he basically said you know i didn't hear anything like get on the ground or show your hands or anything like that and he talks about the locks and how they have to be locked from the inside and things of that nature now he says he never parked on the wrong floor but he says that his wife did and they go into more questioning about that but it's just almost one of those like no it's just you know she made a mistake and parked on the wrong floor now he said the way he always told what floor he was on is because he looked at the numbers on the elevator now the last witness for the day was uh mr armstrong of the texas ranger he went to the Southside flats on september 8th and he talks about the locking system and the handles and he's basically describing it you know and he says that, you know there's no actual handle he caught like a passive handle there's no lock on it uh he talks about the deadbolt above that that accepts the key from the outside and then above that is basically an interior deadbolt now they talk about the time stamps and things of that nature from the door lock showing when it was locked and it shows that the last locking event was at 8 34 p.m and 
this is my thing with that. So I'm like, okay, well, wait a minute. Are they saying that the door locked or are they saying that his testimony got cut off? So we're going to see the rest of it today, but it kind of left with this thought process of, well, wait, are they saying the door is locked now? So, but I think what we're going to find out is that they're saying, well, the last time it locked is 834, which there was an hour savings time or whatever. So that's a little bit different, but, um, it's going to show that I think his door just didn't click is what happened. So, but we're going to see, because if they say no, it's fully locked, that's going to add a whole new layer. So, you know, he did this and he gives his testimony about, you know, what the thing sounds like and how it works. Now we also see like some timestamp pictures of her truck pulling in. And he talks about that where basically the gate didn't close because the last person that went in, it didn't, you know, open for them. And then people walked in and out. So it kept it from closing. So that's why there's no timestamp from her fob showing her entering. For obvious reasons they need to establish this so that, you know, yes, it was her that did this and that she wasn't not there. So a little, a little bit of a technicality, but necessary. Now they show, this is another emotional video. They show a video of him going to the apartment and doing this and he gets there and there's flowers on the outside. I mean, it's just, oh my God, y'all. And he basically is just going in and looking around. There's still blood on the floor. There's the first aid stuff that we talked about earlier. So see, now we know it's like, yeah, Amber didn't do that. That was the other people. So again, no help from her. Now there's other things. They do a whole bunch of what's in the apartment. And one thing that got to me, y'all, was his diploma was stacked up, like kind of propped up there, you know? And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy had so much going for him. And, uh, you know, now they talked about, they made sure to talk about like the 50 inch TV. And I think that's going to be, uh, we're going to see more about that today. And, you know, with the lighting source and things of this nature, because remember she's saying, I opened the door and all I saw was a silhouette of a guy or, you know, a figure coming at me or whatever. So at that point, it's like, well, I mean, a 50 inch TV, a 50 inch TV is a decent sized TV. And I mean, you know what it's like in a, a room with the TV being on like that. I mean, it's a source of light. So there's this level of, well, even that you didn't see, like, you know, how do you, and there's lights right here. I mean, all you have to do is flip these lights. And of course it's this whole thing. Uh, the testimony at some point was like, well, you know, do you want somebody holding a gun and, you know, trying to operate a light and da, 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 da from the defense. And, you know, it's just, it just goes on and on. So this video has become very long. I apologize. I know it doesn't help when I'm like, hi, I condensed eight hours of testimony down to seven hours and 45 minutes. You're welcome. But like I said, the testimony is getting very emotional now. It's moving from being just this kind of technical sounding thing to, you know, actual, you know, oh my gosh, like this is, you know, they're showing us some stuff that I'm surprised they're letting us see. So that's it. Thank you for hanging out with me. Uh, don't forget, you know, check out my website if you want to see more stuff on different cases. Uh, if you want to see uh, the podcast that we do on Reese from Toxic Bliss and I, we do a video version of it and we also have an audio version of it. So join in for those. My heart goes out to Botham Jean and his family. And I will see you all, Sofa Squad, tomorrow.